Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the book of 1 John, and we come today to 1 John chapter 3, and we resume our study in verse 14. So open your Bible to 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We'll begin in just a minute. While you're getting your Bible, that'll give me just enough time to tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is important for me to do because we need the Word of God. We need it bad. If you're not hungry for the Word of God, then you've got a real problem and you should be studying it and you should be reading it because that'll create a hunger for you, in you for God's Word. Um, if, if you have a hunger for God's Word, then take advantage of that and get in the Word and study it and read it and enjoy it and draw closer to Jesus. And you can do that at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And again, that is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible and study it verse by verse with me using my audio Bible messages. One more time, that's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray and get into today's study. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, where the word of God says, Marvel not, my brethren. Don't be shocked, Christian. Don't be overwhelmed, Christian, if the world hates you. I have to tell you that it is a given that the world will hate you if you love Jesus. If you live for Jesus the way you should, and you speak the truth of God's word the way you should, and you don't partake in the dirty jokes in the filthy, vile sitcoms and talk about, you know, how funny it was at work or at school, if you don't join in with that rot, with that trash, people are not going to like you. You're going to make them uncomfortable. And so God warns, marvel not if the world hates you. And then he says in verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. If you can't stand Christians who talk about Jesus as if he is real, if you can't stand Christians because they live the way they should, then you might call yourself a Christian. If you're embarrassed to be around people like that who truly love Jesus, then God says you abide in death. And abiding in death means you don't have eternal life. And not having eternal life means if you were to die right now, you would go to hell. I don't care if you go to church or not. I don't care if you're a church member. I don't care if you're an usher. I don't care if you're a preacher. I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter. Those aren't the criteria for salvation. Those aren't the measuring rods for salvation. Do you live holy? Do you want to live holy? Do you confess when you fail? Do you not live in sin? And do you love Christians who love God and love the Word of God? If you answer no to, no, no to those questions, then you're not saved, and you better wake up. You say, Moret, don't scare people. I'm scaring people. I'll scare people out of hell if I can. I'm not making this up. I'm giving you the Word of God. If it scares you, well, then you're not right with God. But you can get right with God, then you won't be scared anymore. See, it's not that complicated. But if you don't like decent, God-fearing Christians, then you don't like Jesus. And if you don't like Jesus, then you know that you don't know Jesus. Because everybody knows him, likes him. Verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And it's not that the sin of murder is an unforgivable sin. 
But clearly, if you commit murder and you don't repent and you don't confess and you don't ask God for forgiveness for that terrible sin, well, you're lost and on your way to hell. You know, a person can be forgiven of the sins of murder. And God equates the sin of hatred to the sin of murder because that's the spirit behind murder. And you can be forgiven that sin too. But there has to be repentance first. If one continues to murder, they are hellbound. And remember, Jesus said this too, hatred in essence is spiritual murder as far as God is concerned. God says if someone hates Christians, then they don't have eternal life. 16. By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. People say, I love you. But sometimes what they mean by that is, I like how you look. Or how you look pleases me. That's If they had a truth pill, they wouldn't say, I love you. They would say, I love me, and I sure like looking at you. Or I sure like the things that you do for me. And there certainly isn't anything wrong with liking how someone looks. Or enjoying them. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not God's definition of love. The biblical definition of love is sacrificing our desires and our self to meet the needs of others. Jesus died for us. If we want to love like him, like God wants us to, then we must sacrifice for God and for others. Jesus showed us what love is. He showed us how to do it when he hung on the cross suffering so we wouldn't have to suffer. 17. But whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? If a professing Christian has money, I mean money to spare, plenty of money left over after their needs are met, and they don't help another Christian who's in desperate need of help just to get by, then I wouldn't bet a nickel on that person's salvation. People like that are sinful, selfish, worldly, and give no evidence that the Holy Spirit is in them because he wouldn't tolerate that attitude, at least not long term. Jesus said, if you have two coats, give one to who give one to who someone who doesn't have any. Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And if you're not loving in actions, then it's not loving to God. Love does not kick into gear unless it is doing something for the one that it says it loves. God is not impressed with a feelings type of love. He is not impressed with those who only talk about their love. Love becomes a reality when it does something for the benefit of God or for another person. And walking in love isn't always doing what pleases the other person. Walking in love is doing what the other person needs, doing what is in the best interest of another person. And sometimes that, that means disappointing them. 
Sometimes that means angering them. But you see, love does not exist outside the boundaries of God's word. So when you tell someone the truth, it might upset them, but actually you're loving them. You're doing what is in their best interest. What they do with it is up to them. Your business is to love people enough to give them the truth of God's word and to do what they need, whether they want it or not. 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. God wants us to be sure that we are saved. He doesn't want us to go to our grave wondering if our next stop is going to be heaven or hell. God wants us to be sure that we are saved. He wants us to have the peace and the joy and the confidence that comes from knowing that we are right with him through Jesus Christ. He wants us to be confident that if we died today, we would go to be with him. And the only way to have that confidence is by living a holy life, which includes loving others. Loving others doesn't necessarily mean liking others or having fond feelings toward others. Don't mistake like for love. Loving others doesn't necessarily mean liking others or having fond feelings toward others. It means being kind to others. It means doing what is in their best interest, even sacrificially being kind to others and doing what is in their best interest. Loving others means doing what is in the best interest of others. Living like that helps us to have the assurance of our salvation. And you are never more loving than when you are getting out the truth of God's word or helping to get out the truth of God's word. That's the most loving thing you can do. And I know, I know the vast majority of people will not appreciate it. I get that. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life, but few there be that find it. But we, we are loving people, whether they appreciate it or not, when we get out the word of God. And we certainly are loving Jesus when we do that. Because he wants us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are loving him because we are obeying him. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. 19 and 20. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. No matter how bad we are, no matter how bad we think we are, no matter how shocked we are to discover how bad we are, God still loves us. Our hearts condemn us when we think about our sinfulness. But God is greater than our heart. Let our heart tell us that we are no good if it wants to. That's not going to stop God from loving us. That's not going to stop God from forgiving us in Christ. That's not going to stop God from wanting us to be with him forever. Sure, sometimes we have a hard time forgetting our past sins and our hearts condemn us. But God is greater than our hearts. It doesn't matter what our hearts do. It'll steal your joy if you don't accept God's forgiveness and live in the reality of it. But it doesn't change reality. People say, I can't come to Christ. I can't come to Jesus because I've had such, you know, a bad life and now I have such a bad self-image I can't come to Christ. You know, those people need to stop thinking about what they think about themselves and realize that God doesn't care what they think about themselves. Oh, I can't come to Jesus because I have a bad self-image. No, you can't come to Jesus because you're not, you're not open to the voice of the Holy Spirit who's trying to tell you that you are guilty of sin and your only hope is to come to Jesus and that if you come to him, he said, I will in no wise cast out. It has nothing to do with your self-image. It has everything to do with you believing the word of God is the word of God and accepting it.
verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward him. If we don't have any unconfessed sins in our life, then we can have confidence before God. That means we will have confidence to trust him with our future and with whatever we may be facing today. When we are close to Jesus, we know that everything's going to be okay. Nothing in this world can beat that feeling. If you're close to Jesus, you'll have confidence. I mean, you, I'm not intimidated by anybody who doesn't like the truth. I'm not going to water down the truth for anyone because I have a close walk with Jesus. I have all the confidence in the world. Not in me. I have all the confidence in the world that comes from my relationship with Almighty God. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to say what he wants me to say. And no one's going to intimidate me. I don't care what they can do to me. Jesus said, don't fear those who can only kill the body and after that can do no more. Fear those, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. If you don't have any unconfessed sins in your life and you're close to Jesus, you're going to have all sorts of confidence to do what God wants you to do. And you're going to trust him with the future. You're going to trust him whatever problems you are facing today, whatever challenges you are, you are enduring today. You're going to trust him because you're close to Jesus. If you're close to Jesus, you're going to know everything is okay and everything will be okay. Nothing in this world can beat that. Nothing. 21 and 22, let's read it. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We cannot earn a yes answer to our prayers by being good. And I say that because everything we receive from God is a product of his grace. But when we are right with God, when we choose to please him, he answers our prayers because he wants to. He does not answer them because we deserve it. He answers them because it makes him happy to make us happy. And if we, it, it makes him happy to make us happy if we like to make him happy. It's about me and God. It's about you and God. It's a relationship thing. And again, you cannot earn a yes answer to your prayers by being good. Because any answer to prayer that you get is a product of God's mercy and grace. But when you're right with God, then you will choose to please him. And he answers your prayers because he wants to. Because if you want to please him, he wants to please you because you do want to please him. It's all about a relationship with your creator. A lot of people miss that. They think Christianity is simply a religion. I'm not going to say it's not a religion. It has all the earmarks of a religion. But more than that, undergirding it, is a personal relationship with God where you love Jesus and he loves you and, and nothing can beat that. That's where it all begins. Verse 23, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Stop there for a second. The big commandment, the big commandment, that no one can afford to break is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the biggie. To believe in Christ means to believe that he died for your sins. And if you do, if you truly believe that he died for your sins, you will make him the Lord of your life that is the big commandment. You get that one wrong, and you will go to hell for sure. You can't afford to miss that one. Jesus said, if you do not believe in me, you will die in your sin. 
Every other command is secondary to that one because believing in Christ saves us and not believing in Christ damns us. But again, it's not just an intellectual assent to the truthfulness of the fact that Jesus died on the cross. <clears throat> it's believing, and oh, since I believe it, I'm going to act in accordance with what I believe, and I'm going to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. That's saving faith. Saving faith always works, just like love always works. It always does something. So does saving faith. There's, it manifests itself in action, like receiving Christ as Lord and Savior which is when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, then you're really compelled to live for Jesus. And notice verse 23 again. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Loving others will not save you, but it is a sign that you are saved. Anyone who is full of hatred and bitterness is walking around with a spiritual placard which reads, follow me to the lake of fire because that's where I'm headed unless I repent. 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit whom he hath given us. If we are Christians, then God's Spirit lives inside of us. And the Holy Spirit causes us to believe in Christ. He causes us to care about Christ. And he causes us to want to obey Christ. Chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. God tells us not to believe every spirit. You know, behind every teaching, there is a spirit. If the teaching is true, if it lines up with the Bible, <clears throat> then the spirit involved is the Holy Spirit. If the teaching is false, then the spirits involved in that false teaching are evil spirits. They are doctrines of devils. And here's the tricky part. Devilish spirits are very good at disguising lies as truth. But always remember, always remember, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5 teaches that truth never contradicts the Bible. So that's how you determine which spirit you are dealing with. How does it line up with Scripture? Does it go beyond what Scripture says? Does it leave out what Scripture says? Is it contrary to Scripture? Well, then you know it's not right. Verse 2. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear... I'm sorry, I went back to chapter 3. Chapter 4, verse 2. Let's read that. Here we go. By this, we, by this know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, that is not the only criteria, but it was one that was prevalent back in those days because one of the earliest heresies concerning Jesus Christ was that he was not truly man. The Gnostics believed, and they were heretics, and they believed that Jesus was not man. They believed that he was God, but they did not believe that he was man. Well, that's huge. If that teaching continues on, then it denies the fact that Jesus could pay for our sins on the cross because the Bible says he had to become a man in order to pay for our sins. He had to be like one of us to pay for the sins of us. If people are teaching the wrong things about the person of Christ, then the spirit at work in them is a devilish spirit a demonic spirit, an evil spirit. 
And, and again, one of the earliest heresies concerning Jesus was not a denial of his deity. The earliest heresy concerning Christ denied his humanity. Someone says, well, that's not too bad, right? I mean, that's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's very bad because of what I mentioned a few minutes ago. If Jesus is not 100% real human, then he doesn't qualify to be the substitute sacrifice for the rest of us sinful humans. It's a huge deal. That heresy had to stop dead in its tracks. Satan was trying to undercut the work of Christ on the cross. So John writes, every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is of God, because that was the heresy that he was dealing with. That doesn't mean that that you can deny the other fundamental doctrines of Scripture and be of God as long as you get the doctrine of Jesus being fully man right. That, that's not what he's saying. He's not giving this, this command to the exclusion of all other biblical commands and teachings. This was just the big one back in those days that John was dealing with. So he talks about that specifically. And it is one heresy that that definitely needs to be put in its place, even today. Verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. True Christians have the Holy Spirit in them. Consequently, Although they may be led astray for a time, the Holy Spirit will draw them back to the truth. Christians do not stay in false systems of religion. They are brought out by the Good Shepherd. Verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The they and the them refer to the Antichrist or the false teachers who misrepresent Jesus. They're of the world. Notice, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Oh yeah, the masses of the world do not love truth. Or have you noticed that? The masses of the world do not love truth, especially the truth of God's written word. And that's because the majority of people in the world love sin. And love what is false. They want to be told that they are fine with God. That they don't need to be holy, according to the written word of God. That they don't need to repent. That they don't need to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. That's what they want to be told. That's what most people want to believe. And that is what most people do believe. Jesus had been popular because of his miracles. But he was hated because of his message. Consequently, the preacher today whose messages are popular with the unsaved world is not saying what God wants him to say. It is an abomination. It is thoroughly disgusting for these modern evangelicals when they start a church to send out flyers around the neighborhood to ask what unsaved people would like to see in a church and then cater that church service to these unsaved people. Well, we're just trying to reach them, you know, and once we get them coming, then we can give them the truth. You dirty, rotten liar. If you don't have the guts to do it at the beginning, you sure aren't going to have the guts to do it when they start coming and giving and your numbers look good. Don't hand me that. Trying to build an empire, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to look good, that's what you're trying to do. But if your message and your services please the world, you're not saying and you're not doing what Jesus wants you to do. One who preaches the word of God, as it is, will be popular with a remnant of faithful people who want to follow Jesus and sincerely want truth. But he's not going to be popular with the masses of unsaved people. Out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember we're brought to you by your prayers and financial support. If you want to be a part of this ministry, click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, so long everyone.